Let's open our Bibles this morning to John chapter 10. And we're going to be looking at verses 11 through 21. We are continuing through the Gospel of John, and we're continuing on the person of Jesus. And remember that the book of the Gospel of John was written, John says at the end of the Gospel, so that you might believe. He says, I've written these things so that you might believe. And so there's so many narratives here and so many beautiful snapshots and illustrations of the person of Jesus. And so uh, we're going to start this morning at chapter 10, John chapter 10, verse 11, go down to verse 21. So let me read it, and then we will dive in and... uh, Consider all these things. Jesus is speaking here. He says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But he who is a hireling and not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Therefore, there was a division among, again, excuse me, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, He has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? And others said, These are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Let's pray together. Lord, once again, I I just want to thank you, and we want to thank you corporately for the Alpha Pregnancy Center, Lord, that they exist here, and uh, Lord, we pray for them. We lift them up to you, Lord. May you prosper them more and more. May you bless them. May you protect them. May you show the body of Christ in Napa how to get behind such a ministry as that group. Lord, for us this morning, Lord, would you speak to our hearts, we pray. Would you instruct us? Would you show us the beauty of Jesus? Would you show us, Lord, how available you are, how present you are? Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Adam, I'm sorry to bother you. Let's just turn the fans off. I'm hearing kind of some noise going through the microphone. This is a really good microphone. It could almost pick up my thoughts. So I gotta be really careful here. (laughs) Be careful. As, as we're going through the Gospel of John in this portion, Jesus has healed a blind man, and there was great opposition from the religious leaders of Israel because he did it on the Sabbath day, and, and the Sabbath day for the Jewish people was to be a day of rest, and yet they took it so far that they said not even good works could be done on the Sabbath. And so they are really opposing Jesus here, um, and there's been a, a kind of a long continuing narrative about this. Jesus has now gotten into this kind of illustration of himself as being the shepherd over God's people. And so this is a great comparison here, this chapter 10, this whole area here about Jesus, the good shepherd, and those who are supposed to be under shepherds of the people of God, those who are supposed to be caring for the people of God, but were not caring for the people of God. And so the title of the message is The Good Shepherd and the Hirelings. And so one of the first things we see here is a comparison between the shep- a good shepherd and a hireling. So let's just work our way through the notes. If you want to follow along, I'm just going to kind of read and get us going here. Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders of Israel. They were supposed to be shepherding the people of God. And the shepherd, of course, would care for the sheep, would would make sure the sheep have good pasture, have good water, would defend the sheep from predators, that kind of thing. And by way of contrast, Jesus is showing these these so-called leaders that they're only hirelings, that they don't have the hearts of shepherds, but they're just in it for themselves. The idea of a shepherd was a, as a spiritual overseer was a well-known idiom to the rulers. And so Jesus isn't pulling something out of the air. You know, if I wanted to give an illustration and I said, you know, uh, being a good shepherd is kind of like being the point guard on a basketball team. How many of you would have any clue what that is? So, okay, there's, the, there's my friends. <laughs> Jesus wasn't picking some obscure thing. He was picking, he was picking out an illustration that they all understood. 
This was well known to them down through the centuries, even to that present day. Here's some verses to consider that. The Old Testament describes God as the shepherd over Israel. David, King David wrote, a very famous psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In Psalm 23, it's called the shepherd's psalm, and it describes the pastoral heart of God for his people, the care, the presence, the protection, the provision. Isaiah chapter 40 says this, he, God, will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. By the way, guys, as we're going through this, we're obviously talking about Jesus, but just, but just ca catch on that what was true of God then is true of God now. If you're a follower of Jesus, these are the characteristics, these are the descriptions of what he is towards you and for you. And Lord willing, that every under-shepherd is towards you and for you as well. Pastoral staffs everywhere should carry also this kind of heart and this kind of sentiment for the people that God has put under their care and under their watch. So once again, Isaiah 40, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm, carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. When the, when the nation of Israel was facing the Philistines and Goliath there at the Valley of Elah, the people were afraid to go up against the, this giant man called Goliath. And so David was sent from, from the fields by his father to go check on, on the battle, to bring provision for his brothers who were there, part of, the, part of the Israeli army. And he sees that no one is courageous enough to go and face Goliath. And he goes to King Saul and he says, I can face, I can face this giant. And he's explaining himself here. Look there, 1 Samuel. But David said to King Saul, your servant, speaking of himself, I used to keep my father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it, struck it, and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. So obviously, King David was a hero of the nation and in the history of the, of the people of Israel. And so Jesus here, speaking of himself in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. I mean, they, they have centuries of references about what a good shepherd is about. They, they, they understood what he was talking about. This, was, this wasn't like my point guard illustration, by the way. Uh, there's the games on today. <laughs> I just have to control myself here. He's not speaking something strange to them. They get it right away, they understand. And as he unravels this thing, they're gonna understand, man, you're talking about us, and you're saying that we're not good shepherds, and he was indeed saying, you're not good shepherds. I'm the good shepherd. So they knew this idiom. Look there in the, at, the, at the Ezekiel passage. God at one point, and many points actually, throughout the history of the nation of Israel, had reprimanded the poor pastoral care of the leaders of the nation. Ezekiel 34 and the word of the Lord came to me, came to Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat and clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fatlings, but you do not feed the flock. The weak you have not strengthened nor have you healed those who were sick, nor bound up the broken, nor brought back what was driven away, nor sought what was lost, but with force and cruelty you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd, and they became food for all the beasts of the field. When they were scattered, my sheep wandered through the mountains and on every high hill. hill. Yes, my flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth, and no one was seeking or searching for them." That's the, the ancient and modern definition of a bad shepherd. It's also the ancient and modern definition of a bad pastor or a bad leadership team on a church. People that are making use of the congregation rather than feeding and caring and loving and seeking out the congregation. For such men, for such women in some cases, the congregation exists 
for the bad shepherds to enrich themselves upon. And it should be the other way around, that the pastoral leadership team, elders, deacons, the men that came and stood up here, volunteering their time, people, you know, kind of as it trickles on down, people serving in the nursery and the youth ministry, existing for the good of the people, sometimes, and even today, and even in this town, and you've seen it and I've seen it, it gets reversed. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, God didn't like it then and he doesn't like it now. And, and I'm, I'm sad to say, but I won't hold it back. There have been, uh, you know, in my time here, uh, since we came in 1991, not gonna speak about anything previous, but there have been pastors here in Napa that I am glad that God has taken them away from Napa. I'm sad to say that, but I, in my estimation, they have done damage to people. And I'm glad that God had moved them on. Doesn't mean that God doesn't love them. It doesn't mean that they can't have a new start somewhere else. Doesn't mean that they can't turn over a new leaf. God's mercies are new, how often? Every morning. So that anybody, you know, I love that we can always go to, you know, we can always push the reset button with the Lord. And we can always start over and a pastor can start over and a pastoral staff can start over. But I have been extremely grieved uh, in some instances and I'm not trying to start a fight here. You don't have to try to figure out who I'm talking about, okay? Because my microphone's not gonna pick up your thoughts and you're not gonna get my thought and all that. I'm, but I'm just saying, God, God does not like when those who are put in charge not only neglect the people of God, but take advantage of them. And so if you've been hurt by a bad pastoral staff, bad pastor, bad deacon, elder, whatever the case may be, God's heart grieves over that with you. Don't, don't make Jesus guilty by association, please, <laughs> okay? Because that's not him, is it? And there's a lot of people that leave church because they have a bad experience with such people that should be serving the people of God, and they equate that bad experience with Jesus Christ. The two are not related. And so Jesus is not guilty by association. We're gonna, we're gonna see that. But I wrote here, and I did put it in bold letters, God disapproves of ungodly spiritual leaders. He did then, and he does now. So, okay, Just wanna go on record. So the idea of shepherds as religious leaders was not foreign to, to, the, to these people that, that Jesus is talking to. They, under, they understood, they understood the picture. He does a little thing here on hirelings. Look at verses 12 and 13. Uh, well, back to verse 11. He, here's, the, here's the kind of the positive. I am the good shepherd. The shepherd gives his life for the sheep by way of contrast, verse 12 and 13, but he who is a hireling and not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees, notice, because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. So in that day, uh, even to the present day, Israel had many false prophets and many false messiahs. In these days, there are still false shepherds. H how, how do you identify a, a false shepherd? Well, notice verse 12. He doesn't own the sheep. He feels no personal responsibility. Uh, he sees danger coming and leaves. He does not care about them. Some, ad some things that I added here on my notes False shepherds constantly ask for money, demand unquestioning allegiance, Qu quoting verses like, thou shalt not touch the Lord's anointed. I'm the pastor here. You'll do what I say because I said it. May I encourage you, if the Lord ever, if you, number one, if you ever hear that from me, run me out of town, which won't be hard. <laughs> number two, if the Lord ever leads you somewhere else and a pastor says that to you, leave the church. Do not stay. Our, our loyalty is to Jesus Christ, amen. amen? Now, does God use people? Obviously and absolutely he uses people. Does Satan use people? Obviously and absolutely. And sometimes Satan uses people masquerading and parading around in the name of Jesus. And so throughout this thing, Jesus has been saying, my sheep know my voice. And I've been trying to make a point about this. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. They won't follow a stranger. They'll follow me because they know my voice. So many beautiful illustrations that we've considered in the last few weeks. My responsibility as a pastor here is obviously to teach you the word of God, but to get you acquainted as much as I can, and you have to do so much of this on your own, but for the part that I can contribute, to get you acquainted with the voice of Jesus. 
so that if God leads you to another city, another town, another church, even within Napa, and people change churches, and I'm fine for that if it's for a good reason, that you go to another church, another town, another state, other side of the world, and you can recognize the voice of Jesus there. Just because a church has a cross on the steeple or uses the name Calvary Chapel or which we're affiliated with the Calvary Chapels or something like that, doesn't necessarily mean that the Lord is working in that church. And so guys, ultimately, the responsibility of you recognizing the voice and the leading and the presence of God is ultimately up to you. If you're a newer Christian, you're developing that ability to discern the voice of the Lord. How do we do that? Obviously by reading the word of God, through prayer, by listening to the Lord. If you're an older Christian, and I'm speaking at least chronologically, if you've been a Christian 20 years, you should be able to pick the voice of Jesus out of a crowd real easily. And if you can't, may I I lovingly say with a big old fat smile on my face, (laughs) you better get to it. It's such, it's, such a, it's such a sad thing to see Christians who are older in the Lord according to calendar years that still can't discern if the Lord's speaking or not and are following trends and are following other movements and other little kind of mysterious and superstitious things presenting themselves as being from Jesus. It just shouldn't be. Guys, if you're an older Christian, can I exhort you guys a little bit? Can I spank you a little bit if you need? If you're an older Christian, then act like one. You should know the voice of the Lord. In fact, it says in the book of Hebrews, by now some of you should be teachers. But now we have to go back and lay the elementary basic groundwork again because you haven't been paying attention or you've just been neglecting the voice of the Lord. So Jesus has made a real big deal. The reason I make a big deal about it is because he made a big deal about it. My sheep know my voice. So if you're sitting in a congregation at a home fellowship chatting with somebody over coffee or something like that, because you know the voice of the Lord and are familiar with the voice of Jesus, if you're talking to somebody that says, I'm here in the name of Jesus Christ, and you're not discerning the voice of the Lord, even though they're using the name of Jesus and speaking words from the Bible, the cults do this too, don't they? You should say, it doesn't sound like my shepherd. You're using his words, but I don't hear the inflection of his heart. You know what I'm saying? Walks like a hireling, talks like a hireling, probably is a hireling. And so there's some responsibility that is is really necessary for all of us to, to take upon ourselves. So things like unquestioning allegiance, hirelings manipulating control people and families, hirelings pretend to do miracles, they intimidate people into making false claims of healing sometimes. Does God heal today? Absolutely. I heard a story, you may have heard the story, I'll be brief, people going to a healing service and they're getting interviewed and people are lining up, you know, outside an arena and uh, people are just kind of getting interviewed outside the arena and what do you kind of, hello brother, hello sister, what kind of miracle are you hoping for today? And well, I'm, I'm, I'm here and I have this illness here and I'm really hoping for this and they're riding and you know, the, the miracle worker gets up in front of the people and he's got an earpiece. And the people that took the interviews are saying, yeah, the lady in the seventh row over on the right side with a blue sweater, she's, she has, uh, you know, some cancer. There's somebody here with a blue sweater, or, you know, deceiving the people. I mean, these people have been found out, and I'm glad. Because it's a, it's a sham, and it's a shame. And it, and it brings sh- shame upon the name of Jesus. And I'm glad that the Lord loves his church. And I'm glad that the Lord disciplines those whom he loves. The fear of the Lord needs to start in the house of God, don't you think? And and the Lord, you know, eventually the Lord exposes such hirelings, and I'm glad that he does it. He does it because he cares for the people of God, and he cares for the flock of God. So, long story short, hirelings don't care about the flock. They're in it for themselves. I'm sure I'm speaking that to which you guys know and understand. Conversely, what is the uniqueness of Jesus, the good shepherd? Working through our notes, verse 11, Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. Now, why did Jesus give his life, and what are some of the benefits of him giving his life? I have a list of scriptures here. Jesus, the good shepherd, gave his life for his sheep. Why was that necessary? And what do we gain? 
Galatians 1.4, I've made some of these words bold and these are the points that I want to emphasize. Jesus gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of God, our, our God and Father. Jesus died on the cross for our sins to pave the penalty of our sins, but also to deliver us from the influence and the power that's in the world around us. To give us inner strength to break the domination of sin over the life of the Christian. Ephesians 5, it's about marriage, but it's about Jesus. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. Don't turn the page over yet. I heard you. (laughs) Notice this list. Why did Jesus die for you? To sanctify you, to cleanse you through the washing of the water by the word. Why Why is one of the main reasons that we study the Bible here? Because it cleanses you, it washes you, it exposes wrong thinking, sinful propensities, Uh, maybe mixed motivations that you have. Maybe you have a goal to do something good, but you're gonna take some, you know, shortcuts to get there. The word of God washes us and cleanses us if we will allow it. The Lord loves to wash his sheep, to cleanse his sheep, that he might present us to himself a glorious church. The Bible says the outer man is perishing. The The body is perishing, but the inner man is renewed day by day. It doesn't look like it from the outside and it may be true and it probably is true, but on the inside I'm getting more glorious all the time. (laughs) And so are you as you're following Jesus. And Jesus died to do that work in you. He died for me so that he could present me without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that I should be holy and without blemish. I mean, imagine, guys, going, you know, sometimes I think about a a wedding or something like that. All the effort that is put into presenting the bride to the groom. And the bride, I mean, the groom is gonna love the bride, but you know, when you hear that that music, bon, dun, da da I mean, let's stand and everybody's, you know, all the, phones and the cameras are going and, there, and here comes the bride and she's got taco sauce on this side and chocolate sauce over here and you know she just finished a maple bar and there's icing up on her face and uh, I mean she's being presented but it's not exactly you know without spot or blemish you know <laughs> and when the Lord presents us to the Father in heaven there's not going to be one thing out of place isn't that amazing and I consider my own life, look in, the, look in the spiritual mirror, I see all these spots and blemishes. But the work of God is so that he can present me before the throne of God without spot or blemish or wrinkle or any such thing. And that's what the good shepherd does for his sheep. He's concerned about the present and the eternal condition of his people. Now let's turn the page. <laughs> I like to have fun with you guys. Hebrews chapter nine. If the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, Old Testament sacrificial system, the sprinkling of the unclean sanctifies for the the, purifying of the flesh. I'm not gonna take time to explain that. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, I love this, to cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Sometimes people say you Christians are brainwashed and I'm saying absolutely. (laughs) I need my brains washed. I need my conscience washed. I need my inner man cleansed. All the ways that perhaps we can try to make ourselves right with God that leave us wanting on the inside. Jesus died so that when we come to him in faith we realize my, my shame, my guilt, all of these things that I carry, guys, How heavy is shame? How heavy is guilt? Eyes here. (laughs) How heavy is shame and guilt? What what was talked about this morning? If you've gone through some of those things that were spoken about this morning with Lisa and all that, the Lord loves you. Amen? Whether you're the guy or the gal, the Lord loves you. 
And you might be saying, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna volunteer for that center so maybe I won't feel so bad about my past or I'm gonna send money so I won't feel so bad about my past. Jesus died for your past. Right, guys? Yeah. Amen or not? Amen. To cleanse your conscience. The good shepherd cares about how you feel on the inside. Hireling doesn't. The hireling just wants you to fall in line. Make sure you pay your tithes. Make sure you do what I say. We had a meeting, where were you? Not, is your family okay? I noticed that you couldn't make the meeting. We had a meeting, if you're committed to the Lord, you're gonna be here. There's a heaviness about a hireling's hand. There's a refreshing and a lightness and a, a life-giving aspect to the shepherd's hand. That's, that's, that's beautiful about Jesus, don't you think? Let's continue on. Verse 14. Beautiful descriptions here about Jesus. He says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and I'm known by them. One passage here. Peter, or excuse me, Paul tells Timothy, the solid foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. The Lord knows those who are his. He knows you. If you, if you have the, what would be called even a mustard seed of faith, he knows that your heart has been given over to him. He sees you, he knows you, he recognizes you. You're not, excuse me, you're not lost in the crowd. Verse 15, amazing verse. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. And I want you to notice this. If you like to write in your Bibles or, or mark them up or whatever, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. As the Father knows me, in the same way I know the Father. For Jesus to know the Father as the Father knew him indicates the highest level of communion and oneness. That little word as, okay? A lot of you here know my, my lovely wife, Deborah, here in the front row. In case you're new to the church, my lovely wife, Deborah. A lot of you know her, but you don't know her as I know her. And a lot of you know me, but you don't know me as she knows me. Why? Because she's my wife and I'm her husband and the two have become one. And that indicates the most extreme familiarity and unity. And Jesus here is saying that about himself and the Father. He says, where am I? Verse 15, thank you. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. Think about it. I, he's saying, I know, this is, this is my paraphrase, and this would, this would be absurd for me to say. As well as God knows Bill Walden, Bill Walden knows God just as well. Good, thank you. That's heresy. As well as God knows Bill Walden, Bill Walden knows God just as well. There's no way I can know God just as well. Why? Because he's infinite and I'm finite. How can an infinite, how could a finite being know an infinite being as well as the infinite being knows the finite being impossible? cannot happen. Only an infinite being could know another infinite being. Jesus is claiming deity here. Do you see that? Verse 15, as the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. He's, he's claiming that as an endorsement of divinity and authenticity. I'm the good shepherd. My Father, I know him just as well as he knows me, and he would back me up on this. And he says in verse 15, and I lay down my life for the sheep. So it's not just a matter of me laying down my life for the sheep, it's that the Father knows me through and through. I'm authenticated, I'm the real thing. I lay down my life, his death was completely voluntary, Jesus was not a victim. Always keep that in, my mind, in mind. He says, for the sheep, for the benefit of the sheep, and because of love for the sheep, willingly, came to earth, willingly sacrificed himself. Verse 16, another beautiful verse. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The good shepherd and his church holds no racial or cultural prejudices. At this time, the Jewish people could never imagine that God would ever love the Gentile people. There was a great racial and cultural divide there. You guys know that for the most part. 
But Jesus says here, and he's speaking in the future here, other sheep I have which are not of this fold, I will bring them in, they will hear my voice, there will be one flock and one shepherd. He's just simply saying that the church of Jesus Christ has no racial divide, no ethnic barriers, no cultural divisions. Would you guys think that's a good idea? There are, there are churches today that, that, that pride themselves in excluding other people. By skin color, by social status, they may do it openly or they may do it kind of inconspicuously, but they do it. And my prayer for Cornerstone is that that would never, ever happen here. The door needs to be open, amen? It doesn't matter what you look like or what your background is or anything else like that, guys. May I encourage you guys also, um, you know, as the days go forward here, We as a church, today, we need to be having our hearts open and ready for all kinds of different varieties of folks walking in here. And because we say welcome in the name of Jesus Christ, God bless you, it doesn't mean that we condone anybody's sin. But the church is, is, is one of the places where sinners find Jesus, right? We don't say clean yourself up and then come to church, right? We, come, we say, come and meet Jesus. He'll clean you up. But if a man comes in and dresses like a woman or a woman comes in and dresses like a man or any number of things that are increasingly popular, are we gonna be okay with it, yes or no? Yes. We very well may see. May we pass that test well, amen? And because we welcome folks doesn't mean that we condone it and it doesn't mean that we, we wink at it. We want to let people know that you're welcome to come and hear about Jesus, and we're going to let Jesus work on people's hearts. And so all over the nation and all over the world, those kinds of challenges are increasingly coming upon the church. And we see here that Jesus is saying, my church has no racial divides, no cultural divides, there's no divides at all. I have sheep of another flock that you currently hate, but they're going to be in my flock too. And so Jesus' heart is huge for humanity, isn't it? Good or bad? It's good. In Acts 10, 28, Peter had this statement to make as God revealed to him this very thing. Peter said to Cornelius, excuse me, a, a, a Gentile man. Then he said to them, you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation, but God has shown me that I should call, not call any man uncommon or unclean. And so that's the heart of Jesus Christ, the good shepherd. Hirelings, much more ready to exclude people. Verse 17, 18. Therefore my father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my father. Jesus here, I believe, is saying this, that there is a unique love that the father had for, for the son. Notice in verse 17, the word therefore. We always say this. It's just kind of a little way to study the Bible. When you see the word therefore, what is it there for? Jesus is saying, he's saying, take notice, I have something special to point out. Therefore, my father loves me. Why? Because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. So if Jesus, Jesus, are you saying then if you didn't lay down your life, the father wouldn't love you? No, he's not saying that. I believe he's pointing out a, a particular and a unique reason that the father loved him because I have the power to take my life and lay it down and I have the power to take it up again and I'm willing to do this. By the way, I'm not gonna make a big deal about this, but Jesus is the only one uniquely qualified to say, my life. You, you, you have a life, but it isn't your life because it was, starts with a G, ends with an even. It was given to you. But Jesus is eternal, his life wasn't given to him, it was always his. So if anybody ever had the right to say, my life, it was him. Right? And the one who had the right to say more than anybody, my life, was the one who was most willing to lay it down. And I think Jesus is pointing out simply that it's a unique love that the Father has for the Good Shepherd, the Son. Notice the notes here. Hirelings have personal agendas. They know some things about sheep, but they don't have the heart of a shepherd. They are, there are people that look like shepherds, guys. 
but the greatest test is their love for the sheep and their willingness to lay down the lives for the sheep. Hirelings might make some sacrifices, but, but not because of their love for the Father. I want to say these, these, this, this next little portion here just as a word of warning. I don't have an axe to grind. Do I get angry when people parade and, and around in the name of Jesus Christ? I do. And you should get angry too. The Bible says be angry and, and don't sin. There is such a thing as a righteous anger, right? Right? And when you see somebody doing damage in the name of Jesus Christ, you ought to be angry. Don't sin, but it it ought to make you mad. And so this next little section that I want to share here, I want to share not because I have an ax to grind, except that it really makes me mad when these things happen. And I think it makes the heart of God angry as well. I really do. Within Christendom, there are people that know things about sheep, but they don't have pastors' hearts. Their ministry has no involvement with pastoring, only teaching or advising from a distance. I'm not gonna at all suggest that people that have teaching ministries from a distance, I'm not gonna at all suggest that that pastors of a local church are at the top of the food chain within the kingdom of God. I'm not suggesting that at all. There are some people that seem to have kind of international or national teaching ministries. They do conferences, that kind of thing, Uh, you know, they're teaching philosophies and theology, you know, agree, disagree, whatever the case may be. But they can show up and do their thing and walk away. Now, is there no place for conferences? Not at all, I'm not saying that. And some of those people are, are indeed really ordained by the Lord, absolutely. But the point that I really want to make is this. If there's, ever, if there's ever an opportunity for a hireling to get away with acting like a pastor but not having to be one, it's in those kinds of situations. I roll into town, I do my thing, I charge you with the door, and then I'm gone. Oh, the healing didn't work out, sorry. I'll be back in six months, we'll try it again. That kind of thing. I hope I don't sound bitter and all angry today. <laughs> but, but, I, but I am kind of angry. I hate that stuff. And you guys should hate it too. Jesus is the good shepherd. He doesn't do any of that kind of stuff. And so hirelings not willing to lay down their lives for the sheep. Jesus beautifully laying down his life for the sheep. Jesus was the consummate shepherd. He had, the father had a special love for Jesus because of his heart for, for the people. Look at verse 19. By the way, if you have any questions, now's the time to kind of fire them on in here and we'll give it a shot in, in sharing a, a good answer with you. So Jesus presents this big thing that the the religious leaders know exactly what he's talking about. They must be kind of backpedaling a little bit. Jesus is purposely stepping on their toes. You know, it's kind of like if the if the hoofbeat fits, wear it kind of thing. You know, if this if this applies to you, then you know, take heed and 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 get turned around. Verse 19 to 21. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, he has a demon and he's mad. Why do you listen to him? And others said, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of a blind? Blind man, excuse me, blind. So, real short second portion of this sermon, but, but it's just some, some, general op- uh, some general observations. So Jesus, go, follow along with me. I'll try to, try to finish up. Jesus has been having this long narrative about him being the good shepherd and, and kind of a, by way of comparison, those who are hirelings. And then the Holy Spirit inspires John, the gospel writer, to write these three verses in here. And you could almost skip over it because it's, because it's almost like, well, we, we had the good part already. Why are these three verses here? But I just want to suggest to you and really c- kind of ask you to think about, and I, I want to ask you to always think about, why are these verses here? Why does, it, why does it matter that there was a disagreement? Right? Does the Holy Spirit waste ink? <laughs> no. Holy Spirit doesn't waste ink. Th- this is what I want to encourage you about. There's a disagreement here, and we shouldn't be surprised that there's a disagreement. Have you, have you noticed that people disagree? Anybody here notice that people disagree? <laughs> You may disagree with that statement, I don't know. (laughs) People disagree about everything. People disagree about, you know, Benjamin Netanyahu's speech to to Congress. People disagree with 
vaccinations. People disagree. Uh, you know, I mean, you, if you're a Giants fan, you go to the Dodger Stadium, you get beat up. If you're a Dodger fan, you go to the Giants Stadium, you get beat up. They disagree about sports events. They disagree about, you know, people disagree about everything. So we just live in a world of disagreements. I'm sure you've noticed. But, but I, I hope that our hearts, uh, and I, I think I've seen this, and, I'm, and I just want to encourage you guys. Sometimes when people disagree with us about Jesus, we really take it personally. And sometimes we even say, oh man, I'm getting persecuted. Well, I think persecution might be a little, little stronger than just disagreement. People are gonna disagree about Jesus. It's just the way that it is. Look at verse 19. Therefore, there was a division. They just disagreed. I guess I just wanna encourage you. Don't let your boat get rocked if people disagree with you about Jesus. It's just gonna happen. It's absolutely gonna happen. So, you know, don't, don't take it personally and don't think you've done something wrong or that they're a bad person or something like that. People just disagree. In general, vanilla, or chocolate, I don't know, let's draw swords and fight to the death. You know, like, people just disagree. And then there are people obviously are gonna disagree about Jesus. But, but let's not take it personally. Let's just kind of move forward with life. This is a real, real neat thing to notice. Also, verse 20. And many of them said, he has a demon and he's mad, or why do you listen to him? As followers of Jesus, don't be surprised if you're challenged. What do they say to these guys? Why are you following him? He's crazy. Let's say you're having coffee with a friend, and I mean, how would that be? You're leaning over your latte and just, the Lord's done so much in my life. You're out of your mind, you know? <laughs> it could happen, you know? It, it just happens. Once again, I just want to encourage you. Why did the Holy Spirit put these verses in here? Would the narration about the Good Shepherd have been complete without these verses? Yeah, I think. But not everybody's gonna believe the narration of the Good Shepherd. So I think God, in his love for us, just wants us to realize we're gonna tell people about the Good Shepherd and some are gonna think, you're crazy. You're extreme. You're too religious. I'm glad it works for you. You know, all those kinds of things. We shouldn't let it get to us. Just keep keep pushing forward. I love verse 21. Others said, these are not the words of one who has a, has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? I love verse 21. Other people are go, well, you know, I don't know, but it doesn't make sense to me that you think that Jesus has a demon or something like that. One, one thing that each, every Christian in the room, one thing that you're an expert on is your own testimony. You absolutely know your own testimony. And so I think these guys in verse 21, what I really like about these guys in verse 21, they're just, they're, just tell, they're just responding with what they know. And so guys, I just want to encourage you, just respond. Again, here you are at Starbucks. Pete's if you're a little more upper class. <laughs> Vir- virtual coffee if you're a snob. If you don't know where that is, well, You're having your fancy $17 coffee drink, you know. You bought it for this unbelieving friend that you're trying to share the Lord with, and you're sharing your story, and they lean over and they just go, I really liked you, but I think you're nuts. You know, it might happen. Even, at, you know, over, even over a $17 coffee drink, it might happen, you know. And then you can just go, well, it just doesn't make sense to me that history has recorded that there's this guy named Jesus and that billions of people have followed him. And so many lives have been changed. And, the, and you start giving all, and, and my life has been, been changed. And you just start giving all the facts. It's just a beautiful way. Why did the Holy Spirit put verses 19 to 21 in here? Because we need to, we need to remember those verses. We believe in the Good Shepherd, amen? A lot of people don't. Don't take it personally. They might even lean over and just go, you're out of your mind. <laughs> Well, whether I'm out of my mind or not, I love the Lord. <laughs> I'm ha- if I'm crazy, at least I'm very happy about it, you know. <laughs> and He's changed my life, you know. I don't, th- I don't think, I don't think the Lord wastes one word in the Bible. I think it's all there for our edification. By the way, a couple more thoughts, and then I'm going to finish. Some of these people are making the shift from thinking that Jesus is demon possessed, they're making the shift over to believing that he's the good shepherd. Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus the Pharisee, these guys are making the shift. 
they're getting deprogrammed. The lights are going on. And that can be a little messy sometimes, but it's happening for those guys. And then finally, I'm glad that Laura read that verse where you are. Thank you, Laura. The verse that Laura read, the question about Jesus being the good shepherd, you know, is really gonna be settled someday because every knee shall bow, amen? And every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. The whole world's gonna know one day that Jesus is the good shepherd. And we're so glad to know that now, aren't we? Amen. Life group questions. There's your homework. Get ready. This is what we're going to do at our life groups. Number one, go around the room and introduce yourself. So go home, stand in front of your bathroom mirror. You could practice that. Number two, how long have you been at Cornerstone? Check with your significant other or somebody else that you think noticed. <laughs> Number three, what was the thing that stood out the most to you from the Bible study today? I'm sure the humor. <laughs> number four what was the most challenging thing you got from Sunday's Bible study it's really okay if you say you know I just don't know if I believe what, or disagree with Pastor Bill about he said this or that or I don't quite understand or did he mean this because this means this feels contrary to what he said three weeks ago or something like that those kinds of statements are not out of bounds they're absolutely they're all fair, fair statements even in the group I'm leading <laughs> and so it's, uh, it's good to say, it's, it's okay to, to, to go there. I just wanted to kind of give everybody permission. If you kind of think, oh, I don't know if you got that quite right, discuss it. And, and uh, that's how we grow, right? So any questions for us today here? How do we help someone that seems deprogrammed? If, you're, if in the context of my message today, deprogramming means you're, you're coming from a place of not believing in Jesus to a place of, of having faith in Jesus, spend time with that person, go through the word of God with them, talk about Jesus, look at the Bible, pray with them, uh, discuss things openly and honestly and, and without defensiveness or anything like that. I think that's one of the best ways. That's just called discipleship. And so you're helping somebody grow in their faith. So good question, what else? I heard that some churches in America are being forced by government to marry homosexuals, is that true? Uh, yes it is, to my knowledge. What will Cornerstone do if we are forced to do it? We won't do it. You know, I, I've already turned people down for other reasons in, in regards to, to marriages, and it's never because a place of superiority at all. I'm a Christian because I'm a sinner. <laughs> I need Jesus, right? I've, 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 ne I've needed a savior, I still need a savior. But I've, I've shared with people before, look, you have your conviction that getting married to this person is the right thing to do, and I'm not gonna try to change your conviction. But I have a conviction that if I marry you, I'm gonna go against my conviction. So are you gonna ask me to go against my conviction to grant you your conviction? Is that a fair thing to do? And I've never heard anybody say, yeah, I'm gonna force you to go against your conviction to grant my conviction. Nobody ever says yes, so. I would, I would just say no, and, and then we'll go on to the next thing. In verse eight, who is all who came before Jesus? Oh, you're making me do homework here, aren't you? My goodness gracious. Chapter 10, verse eight. All whoever came before me, I would say all whoever came in his name. Jesus here is saying about uh, people who came in his name as a shepherd or a pastor of the sheep. All whoever came before me are thieves and robbers. The sheep did not hear them. I would say those who came in their own name and not as endorsed by God the Father. Any other questions? Hello upstairs. Romans 14, it talks about not stumbling our brothers with what you eat, drink. Does this go with doctrine too? Uh, I wouldn't say that it goes with doctrine. Uh, not stumbling your brothers with what you eat or drink. Romans chapter 14 is about uh, some people have a conviction that it's more godly perhaps to not eat meats or not eat porks or certain things like that. The Jewish people in the Old Testament had a, had a kosher diet restrictions. There were things they could and couldn't eat, could and couldn't eat. And they were to be a, a people that were set apart from the other nations. That same commandment does not extend its way forward to the present day church. But there are still people who have that kind of background who feel like I, I need to go to church on this day and I can eat or I can't eat these kinds of things. I can or can't have, enjoy certain kinds of entertainment or have a glass of wine, uh, that kind of thing. And so this is not a salvation issue. This is a matter of personal holiness and conviction and sanctity. And, and there are places in the Bible where 
does the Bible, does the Bible say to not go to the movies? Does the Bible say to avoid all kinds of ungodliness? Okay, and so where do we draw that line? You know, for some people, if any, you know, going to the movies, they're gonna see something that's gonna stumble them, even in a preview or something like that. Uh, I had a pastor before, Debbie and I had a pastor before, we struggled a lot with lust, therefore he didn't go to the beach. He didn't wanna see women in bathing suits, but he never preached that the beach was evil. <laughs> Just for himself, he didn't go. And I never stood up there and said, you know, Pastor, there was really good waves today. You should have been at the beach. Yeah, we don't do that. And so Romans chapter 14 is about personal responsibilities within the freedom of the Christian life. That's different than doctrine because doctrine is set. Man has sinned. Man needs a savior. Jesus came to be the savior of the world. He died, he was buried, he rose three days later, he ascended to heaven, so on and so forth. Doctrine is set. So we don't try to not offend people by changing doctrine, but we can be flexible in other areas. I have freedom, I have freedom to eat, you know, meat, thank God, you know. <laughs> but if you don't, and you're coming to dinner, I'm not gonna force you. We'll have vegetarian meal that, and then I'll, you know, I'll slam some hot dogs after you're gone or something. You know? <laughs> You know what I mean? We're not, we're not gonna force somebody to have our personal convictions, and I'm teasing about all of that, you know? But we're not gonna have, force somebody to have our personal convictions. So Romans 14 is more about that, not about changing doctrine. If it was a clear doctrinal issue, then we'd find all through the Bible to not eat certain things or drink certain things or do certain things. So, hope that answers the question. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? You spoke of false healers. There are false healers. There are people who masquerade as healers. Can, the, can a demon open the eyes of the blind? The question was asked in such a way that the answer would be no. There's an interesting thing that the Bible says in First and Second Thessalonians about the Antichrist, that he will come doing false miracles and will deceive many. When you think about in the history of the nation of Israel, when Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh, and they were saying, God has sent us here, Pharaoh, to tell you to let my people go so that they can go and worship me. Aaron was to throw down the rod of Moses, and as a sign, uh, Moses' rod became a snake. So a piece of wood came to life and became a snake. The magicians in Pharaoh's court did the same thing. So Satan apparently has some power to do some, and what would I say, miraculous? I don't, I don't know if I would use that word. I would just say supernatural things. As it turns out, Moses' you know, rod ate, serpent ate their serpents, and so on and so forth. There are, there are those who are pretend healers, and then there are the works of the enemy, such as the magicians in Pharaoh's court that seem to indicate that Satan has power to do supernatural things beyond the natural realm of things. But when I hear the word miracles, I tend to give it more of a positive spin or feeling to it in that it's a miraculous work of God for the benefit of people and the glory of God. So, hope that answers that question. Keep them coming, guys. How responsible is the shepherd to and for those he hires? How responsible is the shepherd to and for those he hires in regards to pastors? Well, I'm responsible both for and to our pastoral staff. I, I, I'm here to, hopefully I'm watching out for those guys. And I, I like the phrase uh, regarding pastoral leadership, the, the first among many, in regards to there being kind of a, a head guy over a church. I believe that's a biblical idea, but that doesn't make me a tyrant or a king. And so I'm not beyond reproach and I'm not out of the realm of accountability. And there are times when these guys suggest this or that, either on kind of a personal level or a, or a ministerial level, and they have good ideas and they have good hearts and I need to respond to them. So I'm both accountable to them and accountable for them, but that doesn't upset the order of, of the chain of command. And so I'm also accountable to the board to a certain way, but that doesn't kind of destroy the chain of command either. Uh, I, I remember a while back, uh, Mr. Paul Schrader there <laughs> to telling me a, a couple years ago, uh, you know, this has been real nice what you've been doing on Wednesday nights, but you really need to get back to this. You know, I'm like, and then all the other guys said, yeah, you really need to get back to this. Okay. 
and they were just encouraging me like, hey, we had, a nice, we had a nice detour for a while, we studied this for a while, but you really need to get back to that because we've kind of exhausted it. We, you know, it's kind of like we know, I, I'm not calling you out, Paul, I really, I, you know what I'm talking about, I really appreciate that, that, that here there is a chain of command, but everybody can talk to everybody. There's nobody that's perfect here, right? Only one, right, the Lord. So I'm responsible for and responsible to these guys, and it, and it works both ways. And, and uh, you can check with my wife on that. <laughs> how do you deal with a Christian who is always trying to push their doctrine how they believe? Well, I would try to reason with them, and I'd go to scripture and try to talk it through, and then after a while, you just quit arguing. If they're trying to push a doctrine here, we'd follow that same process. If I think it's a doctrine that's dangerous to the church, I, w- I would invite them to, to have fellowship somewhere else. Because people do try to bring in doctrine to this church that I, that I just, I'm not saying I know everything, but I have to follow the convictions that God has given me and my understanding of the word. If somebody tries to introduce a doctrine here that I think is gonna derail uh, the, the trajectory of the church or is gonna be damaging to the people of God, I'll ask somebody, you know, we'll talk about it. And if they refuse to, to kind of keep quiet about it, I'll ask them to leave. And, and I've done that before. We try not to make a big deal about it. But I've been given a responsibility, right? So, and I need to answer to the Lord about that. And I'll often bounce it off the other pastors. I'll say, hey guys, I'm having trouble with such and such or this person over here. And we always, we always presume that nobody means harm. Every, you know, that we always presume that people have the best intentions can't judge a man's heart, but, you, but we are to judge doctrine. And if there's a doctrine that doesn't line up with the Bible, I'll bounce it off some other guys, and I'm struggling with this. Is it just me? Do I have a personality quirk besides the obvious ones? Do I, <laughs> am, I, am I overreacting to this? Is this anything I should be, should we be concerned about this or not? And sometimes, oh, it's not that big a deal, or sometimes the guys will say, hey, we noticed it too. Yeah, we need to deal with it. And so, I uh, hope that answers that question. I guess that's it. We kept you over today. <laughs> But that's okay, hopefully. Let's stand together. Father, thank you, Lord, that, that you are so good to us, God. Jesus, you are the good shepherd, and, and we're so thankful, Lord. Um, your word declares that we all, like sheep, have gone astray, Lord, but you've, you've come and, and found us, and you've restored us. You continue to watch out for us. You continue to provide for us. You continue, Lord, to defend us. Your word, your spirit, your presence in our lives, Lord. Lord, we, we, we give you blessings and we give you honor and we give you praise, God, for your love for us. And Lord, I pray that you'd pour out your spirit on all of us, Lord. I pray that our hearts would want you more and more. I pray that our wills would obey you more and more. Lord, I pray that we would love you more and more and follow hard after you, that as the deer pants for the water, so our hearts would pant after you. So Lord, thank you that you have us and that you keep us. We love you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys.